Welcome back, everyone. Today we're going to cover section 2.1. The topic of the section is the uh, the idea of limits. Uh, this section is really an introductory section um, because we're going to be using limits throughout uh, the entire class. Our goal for today is to uh, kind of motivate the idea of a limit uh, through an example. We'll see uh, how limits um, arise when we try to find the uh, instantaneous velocity of a moving object, or uh, how limits arise when we try to find what is called the tangent line uh, to a curve. Um, we're going to give a more formal definition of uh, a limit in the next section. Again, here we're just trying to get everything introduced and motivated. So in this example, we are given a function f of x, which is equal to negative 16x squared plus 256. This model gives us the height of a, a toy helicopter as it moves through the air. It's left out there, but the uh, toy helicopter is just kind of moving straight up and straight down. Um, x is going to be measured in seconds. And we are trying to answer the question, um, will this helicopter uh, survive uh, hitting the ground uh, if it can withstand uh, collisions at speeds up to 100 feet per second? I have a couple equations written down here that will help us uh, along with this uh, problem. One is that velocity is equal to distance divided by time. Here, uh, velocity and speed, technically they are different quantities, and we'll get more into that later. But for now, we're going to use them pretty much interchangeably. Another way we can write that uh, distance over time formula for velocity uh, more algebraically is given here. Uh, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So the numerator f of b minus f of a is representing the numerator still up here. That is the distance or the distance traveled by the object over some time interval. And the denominator b minus a, well, that's representing the time interval of interest. And so we can interpret this uh, a bit more as like the, uh, the final value minus the initial value for distance, the final time value minus the initial time value for that denominator down there. And so if we want to uh, maybe just approximate the, uh, the speed at which this uh, toy helicopter is falling, well, then we need to know that uh, final distance value, that initial distance value, that final time value, and that initial time value. And we should be able to get all this information uh, from our equation f of x. So we'll do more of a graphical interpretation later, but just to get started, let's think about our function f of x. It's negative 16x squared plus 256. That's a concave down quadratic function. And so if we go ahead and take a look at the, the graph of our equation, at least the, the graph or the part of the graph that makes sense for our application, it's going to give us a, a concave down parabola that'll look something like this. Here I'm only graphing the pieces that are of interest to us. We're trying to figure out, uh, will this toy helicopter survive hitting the ground? And so we've got to draw the piece where it hits the ground. I'm ignoring the piece of x less than 0, because um, if we thought about that piece, well, it would show it's hitting the ground, but kind of in reverse. Uh, really, that's maybe describing the, the helicopter as it ascends. So its vertex, the highest point, is up there at 256 feet, and it's going to be dropping over this time interval until it hits the ground. So we kind of already have uh, three quarters of the information that we need. It looks like we know the, uh, the final height, which is when it hits the ground. The initial height is when it's at the peak up there, which is 256 feet. Uh, the piece of information we are missing, well, one of them is, what is the final time? That is the time that corresponds to when the toy helicopter hits the ground. And the initial time, that one's, that one's Gimme, that one's at, at zero. So to find out that, uh, that final uh, time when the toy helicopter hits the ground, we want to figure out, well, when is its height above the ground zero? We can do that really quickly off to the side. We want to know when is the height equal to zero. So when is negative 16x squared plus 256 equal to zero? We don't have to use the quadratic equation or anything too sophisticated to solve this equation. Just got to move things around a little bit. First, isolate x squared by subtracting 256 from each side, and then dividing both sides by negative 16. This shows that x squared is equal to 16. We can then take the square root of each side, find our solution. And technically, we'd have two solutions here, right? Plus or minus the square root of 16. But given the context of our problem, we're only looking at the piece in the first quadrant. We're just going to take that positive solution when x is equal to 4. All right, so now we have uh, all the information we need for our little velocity formula over here. 
let's go ahead and plug everything in and see what we get. So velocity is distance over time, or to find the distance traveled, we have to know the uh, initial position and the final position. So here I'm setting everything up to find the velocity, and we're going to be doing this calculation several times over throughout uh, this example. So here I'm making note of the interval which we are finding the velocity over. It's over that entire four second interval from its maximum height until it hits the ground. And the velocity over that four second interval would be given by, well, f of b minus f of a. That'd be f of 4 minus f of 0 over b minus a, which is 4 minus 0. Using all this notation isn't really necessary for this example, but it's going to help us out in the future when we try to generalize this process and make it uh, work for other things. So let's see, we know the value of f of 4. That's the, the final position, or when the object has reached that height of 0 or hit the ground. We have to subtract away from that the kind of initial position, which is where the object is starting at, and that's 256 feet above the ground. All right, so we have to divide this now by the change in time, b minus a, or 4 minus 0, but 4 minus 0 is just 4. So simplifying this as much as we can, taking negative 256 and dividing it by 4, we should get a value of negative 64, and what should the units of this value be? Well, it's a velocity, so it needs to be something like miles per hour or feet per second. In fact, it is going to end up being feet per second. We can always recover that quickly or figure it out just by looking at the units of the quantities in the numerator and the denominator. In the numerator, we have distance, which was measured in feet. And in the denominator, we have time, which was measured in seconds, giving us feet per second. So we found our velocity over the interval from 0 to 4. Uh, to be negative 64 feet per second. So let's make sure we uh, really understand what this quantity is representing and if it's uh, really giving us what we want in this example. So we're trying to figure out uh, basically the speed the uh, toy helicopter is hitting the ground at. We know as long as it's less than 100 feet per second, it will survive. Well, our calculation at the moment has shown that the velocity is negative 64 feet per second. And velocity and speed are basically the same thing. We'll get into the difference later, but velocity includes direction, so the negative is saying the speed is going down instead of uh, up. And so, let's see. The velocity over this four second interval is 64 feet per second, but how do we interpret that? This is really uh, not the velocity at the moment in time when it hits the ground, but it's really the average velocity over this interval. And so what the average means is that if the object were to fall at this constant velocity of 64 feet per second, then it would only take four seconds for the object to go from the top to the bottom and hit the ground. But um, if we're familiar with projectile motion or objects falling, then we know that it's not going to always move at a constant rate. The idea is when you first release an object or as an object first start, starts uh, falling, it begins uh, rather slowly, and as it falls due to the force of gravity, it starts to uh, increase its speed or its velocity. So what that means for us in this situation is when it first starts falling, it's not falling very uh, fast at all. It's probably falling at a speed of less than 64 feet per second. But as it uh, gets closer and closer to the ground, it has more time to accelerate to increase its velocity. So its velocity or speed is increasing, and it's probably a bit faster than 64 feet per second when it's hitting the ground. How much faster is kind of what we need to determine, because if it's too fast, too much faster than 64 feet per second, if it's over 100 feet per second, then the toy helicopter is not going to survive. So one way to figure that out is, well, kind of what we mentioned in our earlier discussion is, during the earlier parts of our time interval, it's not falling as fast, and that's going to cause our average to be uh, lower than what it might be if we looked at the second half of our interval. Right In the second half of our interval, it's moving much faster, it's had more time to accelerate due to gravity, so let's maybe find the average velocity in the second half of our interval instead of over our entire interval. That will give us maybe a, uh, a better approximation for the uh, velocity when it's actually hitting the ground. And luckily, we don't have to change too much. We just have to go up to our formula above and change a few of these numbers around. All right, so remember, we're going to look at the velocity during the second half of our time interval instead of over the entire interval. So now we're looking at the velocity from 2 seconds to 4 seconds. All of our formulas are still the same. We have to look at distance over time over this time interval. So that'll still be f of b minus f of a over b minus a, kind of 
final position minus initial position. Our final position should still be the same, f of 4. And our initial position now is going to be different because we're not starting at x equals 0 or time equals 0. We're starting kind of midway through at time equals 2 instead. So our numerator should look like f of 4 minus f of 2 this time around. And our denominator, well, that's going to be our b minus a, our final time, minus our initial time. And that'll be 4 minus 2. So we're going to have to evaluate our function to get uh, these f values. f of 4, we already saw, was 0. f of 2 can be found by plugging 2 into our function up here. So negative 16 times 2 squared plus 256. We should get a value of 192 feet. And so now the time interval at which it is falling from 192 feet to the ground is shorter. Now it's 4 seconds minus 2 seconds, or just 2 seconds. And so if we calculate uh, this ratio, negative 192 divided by 2, we now find that our average velocity over this 2 second interval closer to our time of interest is actually negative 96 feet per second. So we're a lot closer to 100 feet per second than we were with our first estimate, but we're still not quite there. But we also have a little bit more time to accelerate. So I think we uh, still may not be sure if the toy helicopter is going to survive or not. How can we be even more sure? Well, once again, we need to improve our approximation for this velocity at four seconds. So, so far in our process, we've looked at the velocity from zero seconds to four seconds, found that average velocity. The second time around, we found the average velocity over a shorter interval. And now we're just going to keep that process going. We're going to look at the average velocity over an even shorter interval. The idea is the smaller our interval is, the more uh, closely it will uh, predict or represent the, uh, the instantaneous velocity actually at time equals 4 seconds. Right? Our process here uh, can't really find the instantaneous velocity directly. We have to do it indirectly by kind of making our time intervals shorter and shorter, getting closer and closer to it, like an instant in time, while always containing that moment of interest when x is equal to 4. So now if we look at an even smaller time interval, maybe from 3.9 seconds to 4 seconds, that will give us an even uh, more accurate uh, approximation for what's happening at 4 seconds. Right? There's not a whole lot of time for the velocity to change from 3.9 seconds to 4 seconds. So when we find this average velocity, it'll probably be pretty quick to the, or it'll probably be pretty close to the uh, actual instantaneous velocity at 4. And our first two approximations from 0 to 4 seconds and from 0 to 2 seconds, there's a lot of time for the velocity to change. Um, with this last one, we're not giving it much time to change, so it should be pretty close to what the actual velocity is at 4 seconds. So once again, we've got to go back up to our formula and change a few things around. All right, so like I mentioned, this time around, in approximating our velocity, we're shortening our interval even more. We're going to go from 3.9 seconds to 4 seconds. So I'm just setting everything up here. f of 4 is now going to be subtracted by f of 3.9. Our denominator is still b minus a. Our b value, or our final value, is still 4. But now our initial value has changed to 3.9. And so now we just have to evaluate our quotient up here. Again, we already know f of uh, 4 is 0. f of 3.9, that one's a, a bit hard to do by hand, so we're definitely going to need our calculators to assist us there. Let's plug that in real quick and see what value we get. So when I evaluated uh, this function at uh, x equals 3.9, I got an output of 12.64. So that means 3.9 seconds uh, after the object has started to fall. It's at a height of... 12.64 feet. You can see my, uh, my drawing over here is definitely not to scale, but that's okay. Um, so let's see, the denominator, we can't forget about that. That's the uh, final time minus the initial time for this much smaller interval. And 4 minus 3.9, that'll be 1 tenth or 0 0.1. And so now if we evaluate negative 12.64 divided by 1 tenth, it ends up giving us a value of negative 126.4. So now we see when we're on this very, very small time interval from 3.9 seconds to 4 seconds, the average velocity, which again is going to be pretty close to the instantaneous velocity, is negative 126 feet per second. And so, well, now 
that is much faster than the survival rate required for the uh, toy helicopter. So I think we can confidently say, no, the toy helicopter will not survive. Because again, if anything's gonna happen, if we looked at an even smaller time interval from three points, say maybe nine, nine seconds to four seconds, it's still gonna give it a little more time for the velocity to increase. So the true actual instantaneous velocity should still be a little bit greater than negative 126.4. But for the purposes of this example, I think we've gone far enough. We, we, can, we can say confidently that the toy helicopter will not fly another day. It's going too fast. So, so far in this example, we've done it totally uh, numerically or algebraically. I want to take a minute to uh, do it another way. We could have also kind of approached this uh, graphically as well, especially if we go back to uh, our velocity formula written in this form, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. That formula should look pretty familiar. We should be able to recognize that as our slope formula from previous math classes. That's technically all we were doing. Uh, we were finding the slope over these different time intervals. And the slope of a function um, is basically representing the average rate of change of a function. And so let's see. If we think about the first slope we found, which would be that average velocity over the time interval from 0 seconds to 4 seconds, that would be the slope between this point on our graph and this point on our graph. And so here I'm drawing in this green dotted line to uh, kind of visualize the slope here. So the slope of this green line is that average velocity that we found over the time interval from zero seconds to four seconds. And basically what we were doing is throughout our process as we were improving our approximation was just changing that first point in our uh, slope calculation. So the second time around when we looked at the time interval from two seconds to four seconds, we calculated a second slope I'm also doing it in green. That's this slope right here. And when we compare that slope to our first slope, we can see it is steeper and more negative. That's what we saw numerically as well. We can do this for our third approximation as well. And when we do that, we get an even steeper line. And so the, the process of these lines we found connecting just two points on our curve, those are all examples of what we call a secant line. So these green lines are secant lines, and the slope of a secant line is always representing like the average rate of change of a function. And uh, this particular example is representing the, uh, the average velocity of the falling toy helicopter. So at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that uh, we're going to be talking about how to use uh, or how limits show up when finding the slope of a tangent line. We haven't defined what a tangent line is yet. I'm going to do that right now. This is still going to be a relatively informal definition. Uh, but a tangent line is essentially a, a unique line that uh, touches our curve at a single point and goes in the same direction of our curve at that point. I always think of uh, tangent lines as, um, well, if you ever seen the movie E.T., and uh, when Elliot's kind of riding his bicycle and goes off the jump, and E.T. turns off the gravity or whatever, and he just keeps going in that straight line. The line he's traveling on is a tangent line. I know that's a pretty dated example, so not everyone's going to understand what I'm saying there. Another way I like to think about that is um, pretend that you're, uh, the graph that you're finding the tangent line or a secant line for is like a roller coaster ride, and you're sitting in a little cart looking forward, riding the line. Basically, if you're wearing a neck brace and you couldn't look up, down, left, or right, but only straight forward, the direction you are looking as your cart travels along the roller coaster or the line that's going to be the uh, direction of your, your tangent line. And so here we can see if we uh, were riding the roller coaster and when it hit the ground, that line that gives us like our line of vision as we ride the roller coaster, that's the tangent line at our point. And we only need a piece of that tangent line for our problem here. The piece we need is the slope of that tangent line. The slope of that tangent line is representing the instantaneous velocity of the falling toy helicopter, in this case at the point uh, when it hits the ground.